Life is fragile. It's amazing what tiny things can actually end a human life. Things like choking on a peanut, slipping in the shower, not looking both ways before you cross the road, going to Chicago. It's so easy for someone to get killed. But in some strange cases, it's the opposite. And today's mad lad is a man who, despite the best efforts of some gangsters, just simply would not die. In fact, he was so unfazed by their attempts to kill him that he didn't even know they were trying to kill him. Mike Malloy, better known as Iron Mike. But before we get into the mad lad, this video was brought to you by Raycon. Raycon are shaking up the industry by offering premium wireless audio at half the price of other brands, and they are endorsed by celebrities like Rich the Kid, Snoop Dogg, and Mike Tyson. I mostly use my Raycons to listen out for the baby monitor, because it seems that that's all I do now. Raycon earbuds give you 6 hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass and a more compact design for a noise isolating fit, and they come in a fun range of colours and patterns with a 45 day free return policy. So get yourself a pair of Raycons by clicking my link down below, by raycon.com slash dankula to get 15% off your order. There are not many records that we can actually find on Michael Malloy but investigations into his identity have best estimated that he was born sometime between 1870 to 1890, and he came from the Irish county of Donegal. He was said to have found his way to Manhattan around the 1910s, as this was one of the peak periods of Irish immigration to America. At the beginning of his time in the United States, he would take on odd jobs such as being a janitor, sweeping the streets, and even becoming a fireman at one point. However, it is said that he would never keep a job for too long because of the Irish stereotype of being a massive drunk. He would always smuggle booze with him into work and sometimes he would get so drunk that he was unable to perform his duties. Unfortunately, drinking on the job was about to become even more difficult for Malloy when the Great Depression hit in 1929. This was especially the case in New York, which seen a lot of hard-working people getting evicted from their homes. And what made things even worse was the fact that prohibition was at its height during the late 20s and early 30s, meaning that you couldn't even drown your sorrows without getting chucked in the cells. As jobs in alcohol were now becoming a rare commodity, Malloy soon found himself on the street and constantly desperate for a drink. His tactic was usually to stumble into whatever illegal speakeasy he could find and start buying drinks on tab. Then, when the bartender realised that Malloy had no intention whatsoever of paying back his tab, Malloy would just be immediately kicked out. And then he would just go and find another speakeasy and repeat the entire process. And considering the types of people that owned speakeasies during Prohibition, this was an extremely risky strategy. One day, Malloy ended up in a speakeasy owned by a man called Anthony Marino. Marino initially took pity on Malloy not being able to pay his tab, so when business was good, Marino hired Malloy to clean the bar and arrange the bottles for a small wage. However, as the Great Depression worsened, Marino couldn't even afford to give Malloy the small pennies that he was dishing out. So he had to kick Malloy out of the speakeasy again. But still, 
Malloy would loyally return to the bar, even during the times when Marino would just kick him out, you know, for not being able to pay back his very hefty bar tab. Some argued that Malloy would always come back, not because of the free drinks he would sometimes get, but because he felt that Marino was his only true friend in the world. Well, Malloy was dead wrong. Marino wasn't part of the mob, but he had a few friends who were struggling to make ends meet. They would very often meet up in Marino's bar to try and come up with various financial scams to make some quick money on the side. However, the gang were becoming more and more desperate and started to turn to some extreme measures to try and keep themselves from losing the speakeasy and becoming homeless. Their methods would become so brutal that the media would soon give them a very ominous nickname. The Murder Trust. Marino got involved with the Murder Trust because by the turn of 1930, his speakeasy was taking some massive hits. This was due to the intensity of local competition and also the fact that his speakeasy was generally considered to be quite a seedy place even by speakeasy standards. This meant that he couldn't attract as many customers and the customers that did visit were usually unable or unwilling to pay their tabs back. The other members of the Murder Trust were Joseph Red Murphy, who was formerly a chemist but now worked for Marino as a bartender, Francis Pasca, who was a funeral parlour owner and a close associate of Marino, and finally, Daniel Kriesberg, who was a grocery store owner and father of three. The members of the trust all had major financial issues, and eventually they became so desperate that in 1932, they turned to insurance fraud. Life insurance fraud. Around this time, Marino was dating a woman called Mabel Carson, who came from a rich family in DC, but she had somehow managed to find herself homeless in New York, with Marino taking her in. And because Marino managed to grind to level 100 speech, he managed to convince Mabel to sign off on a life insurance policy, which would pay out $2,000 to Marino as the sole beneficiary. One night in January, Mabel drank so much that she collapsed to the floor of Marino's bar unconscious. Marino and the rest of the gang members then proceeded to carry Mabel into his room and got her changed into her nightwear. After laying her down on the bed, the gang then proceeded to tip ice cold water all over Mabel and flung open all of the windows in the room. Mabel died shortly afterwards of hypothermia due to the winter winds of New York, meaning that Marino was able to claim the $2,000 as the result of an accidental death. Unfortunately, Marino was only part of a growing number of people turning to murder as a way to get money. There had been many high-profile cases of life insurance fraud going on in New York during the late 1920s, and what's worse is that the amount of money that you got from these scams wouldn't exactly set you up for life or anything. So you kinda had to keep doing it. Marino's $2,000 would be worth about $33,700 in today's money. After this was split between the other three gang members, Marino only really had a few months at best to cover his losses and stay out of the red. The depression had people so desperate that they were willing to sink as low as literal murder just to get by. So by June 1932, the money from Mabel's policy had ran out and the gang were back at square one again. As they were trying to come up with the next scheme to make some quick money, Pasca just so happened to glance over at Mike Malloy who was slumped over the bar. He then turned to Marino, who knew exactly what Pasca was going to say before he even said it. In theory, 
Malloy's death would have been much easier to pull off compared to Mabel's. He didn't emigrate to America with any family and he never had any close friends apart from whatever bartender was serving him that night. And considering how an average of 780 people in New York were dying of alcoholism every year, Malloy would be just another statistic that they could cash in on. Also, given Malloy's lifestyle, dying of alcoholism was pretty much a certainty, so his death wouldn't arouse any suspicion. For the next five months, Pasca would obtain the paperwork for a fake person called Nicholas Mellory. Now, because of how sketchy Malloy's real identity was, the gang's plan was to kill him and then plant these fake ID papers on him. Though many sources estimated that Malloy was at least 50 years old, the gang put him down as 45 on the insurance forms, as they thought that this was the youngest age that they could get away with and make the most money from. Murphy was to pose as Malloy's next of kin to collect the money, and the insurance payout would then be split between all four members of the murder trust. They took out an $800 policy from Metropolitan Life and two $494 policies from Prudential. If Malloy died as a result of an accident, the gang would get what would be worth $67,000 in today's money. Some people have suspected that the only way that the murder trust were able to get these policies is either because the insurance agents were straight up bribed or because they were so desperate to get a commission that they turned a blind eye in order to have the premium approved. With all of the paperwork out of the way, the last thing the gang needed was Malloy's signature. So, after sweetening up Malloy with a few rounds, they handed over a sheet of paper saying that it was a petition to get Marino to run for public office. Some sources even claimed that Marino didn't even bother hiding the text on the form as he knew that Malloy would be too drunk to make any of the text out. And he was right. Malloy didn't even try to read the document and just immediately signed it. So with all of the formalities out of the way, it was time to enact the real plan. The murder of Michael Malloy. At first, the gang believed that it would only be a matter of time before he died of alcohol poisoning anyway, so they decided to speed up the process by offering Malloy an unlimited bar tab. Marino even offered a crash room for Malloy to rest and recover in, but this was so the gang could cash in quickly without the headache of having to go out and find Malloy's body. Because bear in mind, Malloy was homeless. So if he died in his sleep, his body could have been absolutely anywhere. So to save themselves the time of checking every single morgue and every single alleyway in New York, they just let him live in the speakeasy. On the first day of his unlimited bar tab, Malloy guzzled down what must have been a good few litres of very hard and very, very low quality booze until he passed out. And then he did the same thing on the second day. And then the third day. And then the fourth day. And on the seventh day, he did the same again. And after an entire week of unrestrained boozing, Malloy would always pass out, always recover, and always stagger right back up to the bar for more. This plan obviously wasn't working, so the gang had turned to another alternative. Wood alcohol. Wood alcohol is known chemically as methyl alcohol and it's produced by distilling the methanol found in wood and it is incredibly dangerous for human consumption. Consuming just a 4% proof sample of wood alcohol is enough to make you go completely blind. Because things were so desperate back in the days of the Great Depression, 
many alcoholics were actually turning to wood alcohol as a cheaper alternative to regular booze. But as many as 11 people a day were dying in Manhattan as a result of wood alcohol poisoning in 1929 alone. With his background in chemistry, Murphy was able to acquire hundreds of tins of pure wood alcohol, as well as buying ordinary paint thinner and antifreeze for good measure. After easing Malloy in with a few dozen shots of various liquors, Murphy then began pouring him shots of pure wood alcohol, not even mixed with anything, just pure wood alcohol straight out of the tin. Malloy initially chugged down every shot, as he said he liked how smooth the drink was. But after a while, Malloy started rocking in his stool, before finally crashing onto the floor, motionless. The gang then quickly grabbed him and dragged him into the crash room, thanking God that it was finally over with. Until they heard a loud rumbling noise coming from the crash room. Malloy wasn't dead. He was snoring. He'd just passed out. Despite drinking several shots of raw wood alcohol, the man just passed out. He didn't even pass out for that long either. Less than an hour later, Malloy sprang up, walked back over to the bar and asked for more wood alcohol because he liked it so much. Ladies and gentlemen, the Irish. Jokes aside though, how the hell did he survive that? Well, it turns out that whilst Murphy was a chemist, he didn't quite do all of his homework. It turns out that the presence of ordinary alcohol within the bloodstream can offset the most adverse effects of wood alcohol if they were to be consumed within a short time of each other. These guys, they would prime him with regular alcohol for several drinks and then give him the methanol. What they didn't realize that by giving him the ethanol first, what they were doing was occupying all of the metabolic sites. The methanol couldn't get to these sites in the liver to do damage. And so it had to be excreted through the, through the urine. Just a little fun piece of first aid trivia for those watching. That also applies to antifreeze poisoning. If you or a child for some reason accidentally drinks antifreeze, which sadly happens a lot more often than you think, drinking actual booze can somewhat counter its effects and prevent it from doing so much damage to your body. But don't just raid the booze cupboard and then think you're fine. Like, still, go to a hospital immediately. So the gang decided to just keep doing this. Every single day, they would give Malloy shot after shot of wood alcohol. <laughs> but he just wouldn't die. He would pass out, but then a few hours later, or the next day, he would get back up, walk straight back to the bar and say, Randy... I am the liquor, and then order several more shots of literal poison. <laughs> then he would pass out, get back up, back to the bar again, and he would just repeat the whole process over and over again. And the reason he survived is because the gang's so-called expert didn't know that regular alcohol dampens the effects of wood alcohol, and Malloy was being given regular booze alongside his shots of poison. So the worst thing that happened to Malloy as a result of this was just a bit of a bad hangover. After several days of this, the gang started getting really desperate. So they just started pouring Malloy shots of whatever chemicals they found in the cupboard. This included turpentine, horse liniment, and even just straight up literal rat poison. Basically, Anything they thought would make his heart stop beating, they poured him a shot of it. But day after day, Malloy would collapse, get up, and come straight back to the bar for another round. In fact, Malloy felt very special that he was getting to sample all of these 
fancy new drinks that the bar was serving. I think I think the years and years of alcoholism had just completely nuked Malloy's taste buds. It's at this point that Pasca had an idea. Obviously, a seasoned drunk like Malloy could handle a toxic cocktail. But would he be able to handle poisonous food? As a funeral director, Pasca had buried people who had passed away from many different causes. One funeral he organised involved a man that died as a result of eating too many raw oysters and downing them with alcohol. Murphy affirmed that an extreme combination of the two could be potentially lethal to humans, so the gang agreed that if drinking Malloy to death wasn't going to work, they would gorge him to death instead. Murphy prepared a dish of raw oysters which were pickled for a few days in wood alcohol, and brought these out for Malloy to eat. But Malloy just hoovered all of them down, and not only did they have no effect on him whatsoever, he asked for seconds. At this point, Marino decided to go for just straight up poisoning. He noticed a can of rotting sardines and decided to make Malloy a nice sandwich. This delicious sandwich contained rotting sardines, tin shavings, carpet tacks, and crushed glass, with some rat poison thrown in there, you know, for, for a little bit of spice. Marino was basically making sure that if the poison itself didn't kill Malloy, that he'd at least be killed by his stomach getting cut open. But after eating what can only be described as your average food order for spoons, Malloy returned the next day wondering what other free stuff he was going to get. And to annoy Marino even more, Malloy said to him that the food he got was so nice that instead of managing a pub, Marino should open up a restaurant. After what was about several weeks of attempting to poison Malloy, Marino was getting violently angry. He had already wasted a lot of money and stock on trying to kill this one guy, and at one point Marino got so angry that the rest of the gang had to hold him back from walking right out into the bar and straight up just shooting Malloy in the head. After Marino chilled out for a bit, he decided to go for the tried and true method of getting rid of prospective cash cows. Hypothermia. It was January 1933 and in New York temperatures were known to plummet to about minus 26 degrees Celsius or minus 14 degrees Fahrenheit during the night. So the plan was basically to get Malloy to pass out and then dump him in Cretona Park located about half a mile away from Marino's bar. On a particularly cold evening, the gang got Malloy blind drunk as usual, huddled him into a car, and then dumped him on a snow-covered park bench. They then tore his jacket and shirt open, and, just to be absolutely sure, poured ice-cold water all over him before promptly leaving. They knew that when his frozen body was found the next day, it would be chalked up to just another drunk who passed out in the snow on his way home and froze to death in the night. Which, sadly, is a pretty common thing in Scotland. Scottish winters are actually pretty bad. If you've got an outdoor cat and you forget to let it back inside, you don't have a cat anymore. So that very same night, the conspirators poured a few glasses to celebrate and began preparations to cash in on the life insurance premiums the next morning. Or so they thought. Not even 12 hours later, Malloy just stumbles back into the bar. Oh, hey fellas, man, I don't remember anything from last night. Must have had a wild one. Anyway, make me another one of those glass and metal sandwiches. He didn't even have a cold. He didn't even have a cold. So what is the scientific explanation for this one? Well, science didn't really have a lot to do with it. It turns out that not long after Malloy was dumped in the park, 
a couple of police officers spotted him just before the New York winter could kill him. A homeless charity then gave him a brand new outfit to replace the torn and soaked clothes that he was wearing. What made this whole situation even funnier was the fact that even though Malloy didn't have a cold, Pasca was actually suffering from a very bad head cold due to the exertion that it took to help carry Malloy into the park. As you can probably imagine, the gang were at their absolute wit's end and were panicking about having to use the insurance money to make up for the cost of Malloy's death alone. So Marino turned to one of his friends for advice. A hired hitman called Anthony Bastone, or as his friends called him, Tough Tony. Tough Tony basically told Marino to quit all the fancy stuff and just straight up kill him themselves. After Marino fully explained the idea of the scam itself, Tony responded by saying, it could still be an accident. From this advice, Marino wanted a third party to accidentally run Malloy over in their car, and this third party would then receive part of the insurance money as payment for the kill. Marino attempted to get some low-budget gangsters to do the job, but they all refused because they wanted way more money than what Marino was offering. So, instead, he reached out to an associate that he knew called Harry Green. Green worked as a cabbie, so he would have been able to run Malloy over in his cab and not draw police attention to any of the gang members. He agreed to an initial payment of $150 and then receive a good portion of the insurance money whenever Marino managed to cash it in. On the night of the 30th of January, 1933, Marino once again got Malloy so drunk that he was at the point of collapsing. The gang then huddled Malloy into Green's cab and drove to a quiet side road in Pelham Parkway. Green attempted to hit Malloy twice, but he couldn't build up enough speed without Malloy leaping out of the way. <laughs> he might have been heroically drunk and had no idea what was going on, but the man was still quick. <laughs> So the gang opted to shove Malloy onto Gunhill Road, which was the main road that allowed Green to build up enough speed to kill Malloy. And after the third attempt, Green managed to finally hit Malloy. He even made extra sure that the job was done by reversing over Malloy's body and then driving over it again. The gang were about to check if Malloy was really dead but an oncoming car spooked them, so they decided to part ways and get the hell out of there so as not to arouse any suspicion. It's easy to imagine that Marino was probably bracing himself to somehow find Malloy limping back into the bar wanting to order another drink. But, to his complete shock, Malloy didn't show up. And he didn't show up the next day. Or the next week or the next two weeks. And after three weeks of not seeing Malloy, that just confirmed that Mike Malloy was finally dead. There was just one problem though. They couldn't find the body. And in order to claim life insurance money, you need a body to prove that the person is dead. And as Malloy's next of kin, Murphy was calling up every hospital and every morgue in the Manhattan area, but he couldn't get any information on where Malloy's body was. The gang were starting to panic, thinking that authorities might not have been able to identify the body and that Malloy had just been buried as a John Doe, completely ruining their plans. And while the gang were in the bar, sulking at their plan being ruined, the door swings open. <laughs> ah, top of the morning to you fuckers. It's your boy, Mike Malloy. Ha <laughs> ha. Mm, sesh. Despite the taxi having ran him over three times, Malloy only sustained a concussion, a fractured skull, and a broken shoulder. And he was recovering in the hospital, which is why he was gone for so long. He also apparently had no memory at all 
of what happened, fortunately for the gang. But he was told that he was found by a police officer before potentially bleeding out on the road. And to unknowingly rub it into Marino's face, the first thing that Malloy apparently said to him was that he was dying for a drink. Marino and the gang were getting really desperate now. They had considered just straight up hiring a hitman, but they all agreed that the $500 he was asking for was too steep. They even tried arranging a machine gun attack, but they settled on just simply beating him around the head while he was passed out drunk. But once again, Malloy emerged from that completely unscathed. Their most desperate move was to not even go after Malloy himself, but to target another drunk at the bar called Joe Murray. They attempted to run him down and plant the fake ID on his body instead to convince the insurance companies that he was Mike Malloy. But Joe, thankfully, managed to survive this attempt. At this point, Marino had enough. The gang had already spent a collective $1,875 on trying to kill Malloy, which was about half of the $3,500 that they were hoping to get out of the insurance scam. And this was soon to cost even more money as February's insurance payments were due very soon. Marino decided that it was finally time to take matters into his own hands. On the 22nd of February, 1933, Malloy enjoyed his last free rounds at the bar. Once he had drank himself unconscious, Marino carried Malloy to Murphy's apartment and laid him down on the bed. He connected a rubber hose to the gas outlet in the room and placed the other end of the hose inside Malloy's mouth and turned the tap. After 20 whole minutes of breathing in pure carbon monoxide, Mike Malloy finally passed away. For real, this time. Most sources estimated that there could have been as many as 9 to 20 attempts to kill Malloy by the gang in total. Though Malloy was finally dead, Marino was still very angry at the money that he had lost and the fact that he was forced to murder Malloy in such a way that greatly reduced plausible deniability. But he found a way around this. Marino gave a $100 bribe to a crooked doctor by the name of Frank Manzella. He would issue a death certificate that falsely stated that Malloy's cause of death was low bar pneumonia with severe alcoholism as a contributing cause. He would even pad out the lie by claiming that Malloy had visited him days prior to his death, complaining about symptoms of influenza. After this was done, Pasca was tasked with arranging a quick burial for Malloy in the hopes of avoiding any complications with the police or insurance companies and he went as low budget as he possibly could, placing Malloy in a $10 coffin and burying him in an unmarked plot of land. In fact, Pasca was so cheap that he didn't even bother embalming Malloy's body prior to the burial, which would serve to be part of the gang's undoing. As the gang were about to cash in on Malloy's policies, Tough Tony was found dead by gunshot wounds, with Murphy being a material witness to what had happened. As a result, he was forcefully ordered to court, which not only spooked the gang about potential investigations into their own murders, but also made things more complicated as far as collecting the insurance money went. After all, if you are involved in a murder trial, it doesn't look very good if, during that, you are collecting life insurance money over a rather suspicious death. Pasca volunteered to collect the money from the insurance companies and was initially successful. Metropolitan simply reviewed Dr. Manzella's report and gave Pasca their $800 payout, which is about $15,000 in today's money. But then, disaster. 
when Pasca went to Prudential, he assumed that it would be just as straightforward as last time. But then they threw a complete curveball at him. They wanted to see the body. At this point, Pasca was absolutely sweating, nervously explaining that the body had already been buried. At the same point in time, the police were beginning to hear rumours of some invincible hobo named Mike Malloy, who was able to drink poison and survive hit and runs without dying. Soon after this, they received a request from Prudential to investigate the circumstances surrounding Malloy's death. The local district attorney, Samuel Foley, immediately smelled a rat and pressed the police to begin an investigation. When the police exhumed Malloy's body, it was immediately clear that Malloy didn't die from pneumonia. Because of the leaps and bounds that were being made in New York forensic science at the time, they could immediately tell from the cherry red discoloration of the body that he had died from carbon monoxide poisoning. They didn't realize that carbon monoxide in blood is so stable that even if the body was decomposed, you'd be able to tell it was red. And you can see it in your tissue bottle. So the moment he came into the morgue, they would have made that diagnosis. Now, if Pasca had not been such a Scrooge and just paid to have the body embalmed, that would have released the carbon monoxide gas that was trapped in Malloy's bloodstream which would have prevented the cherry red discoloration of the body and forensics would have been none the wiser as to what the cause of death was. This alone was enough to immediately throw the whole gang under suspicion. But it turned out that the police wouldn't need to do much further investigation. The gang had been arguing over the size of each person's share of the money and this led to a lot of disagreements between them. Eventually, Harry Green was so furious over his tiny share that he went to the cops and told them everything. The whole gang then found themselves in the Bronx County Courthouse. The trial began in October of 1933 and the prosecutor was able to bring a flood of hard evidence and material witnesses. The prosecutor had even managed to get Green to testify against the gang as well as the other hitmen that Marino had reached out to for the hit and run job. He even managed to get Joe Murray, the other guy that they tried to kill, to submit evidence relating to the failed hit and run attempt on his own life. The prosecution even raised the suspicious circumstances surrounding Mabel Carson's death, particularly the short period of time between the life insurance policy being taken out and her death by hypothermia. This was also a striking point as it was noticeably similar to a near-death situation Malloy had found himself in during the past year when they dumped him in the park. In response to all of this damning evidence, the murder trust were all over the place. They all attempted to plead insanity at first, but when this didn't work, they blamed the now dead tough Tony into coercing them into the conspiracy. When this excuse completely collapsed under basic scrutiny, the entire gang devolved into just blaming each other. Though no doubt pleased that he had such a clear-cut case, Samuel Foley was pretty disgusted at the events that he was forced to cover in the court. He at one point described it as the most grotesque chain of events in New York criminal history that he had ever seen. On the 19th of October, 1933, the trial was over and the jury found all four members of the murder trust guilty of first degree murder. And at this point in history, in New York, a first degree murder charge was punished by the chair. Danger, danger, <laughs> high voltage. Cut that out. By saving the police time in their investigation, Harry Green was only sentenced to five to ten years for the part that he played in the conspiracy. Dr Manzella was also given a very light sentence for failing to report a suspicious death. 
Marino, Kreisberg and Pasca were told to have a seat on the 7th of June 1934. Murphy had almost secured a retrial due to new evidence coming out that he apparently suffered from some type of mental disorder which could have made an insanity plea more tenable, but unsurprisingly, the district attorney completely shot this down. And Murphy himself was told to take a load off on the 5th of July, 1934. Malloy's death, though it was a hot story at the time, couldn't be described as having a major impact in New York on any kind of massive scale. Organised crime would still be a massive problem in the US for years to come, and the economic hardship that forced people to commit literal murder just to get by wouldn't really be reversed until America's total victory in the Second World War. However, Malloy's case did positively influence many of the people who were involved in the investigation. It was one of the cases that elevated Samuel Foley's fame and career, where he soon became a well-known and popular judge within the Bronx. It also paved the way for many medical journals to identify and cure many new poisons that were emerging from the criminal underworld. Malloy is regarded as a mythical folk hero in New York to this day, though this was less of the case at the time of his death. By the mid-30s, the Irish community were enjoying a newfound tolerance by their American neighbours, and for them, embracing Malloy as a folk hero would be akin to reinforcing the worst stereotypes that they had had to endure for decades. As a result, Malloy was given an unceremonial reburial at the Ferncliff Cemetery, with no wake and no tombstone to identify him. Even Marino's speakeasy and the flat where the murder took place were eventually torn down and weren't even replaced with new buildings. It was noted by one Irish documentary that because of this, Malloy's ghost wasn't even afforded the luxury of having a place to haunt after spending the last parts of his life being completely homeless. What's funny is that despite all of the attention Malloy's story got, nobody actually knew who he really was. He had no close friends or relatives, and even the Irish government's own records couldn't determine the real identity of Michael Malloy. There's loads of theories. Maybe he murdered someone in Ireland and that's why he fled to America and changed his name. There's all manner of things, it's just, at the time, he introduced himself as Mike Malloy. But beyond that, we know nothing else about him. What's even sadder is the fact that the only picture we have of Malloy isn't of any time where he was alive. But when he was already rotting away in a police morgue. I'm not going to show it in the video. I, I like getting ads. But I suppose being referred to as the Rasputin of the Bronx and being a complete legend in your own right isn't too bad of a consolation prize. But at least the last few months of his life were one big happy hour. Kind of. No light. Light, no light. Oh! Top of the morning to you f I'm off the fucking. I'm out of shot now. Top of the morning to you f It's your boy, Mike Malloy. I'm fucking out of shot. Aye, that one. Top of the morning to you f It's your boy, Mike Malloy. Why am I still out of shot? It's Count Dankula on YouTube. Everybody subscribe.